Uh, Greg Glasner was editor of the Herald Progress in Ashland from 2004 to 2012. Continued as a freelance columnist and reporter until that newspaper died in 2018. He also served in similar capacity at the Caroline Progress in Bowling Green. He is co-author of the American Deadline, reporting for a new start of towns in the Trump era, a 2023 release by Columbia University Press, publishes a weekly uh, review of the book, and I quote, a unique and often heart-wrenching collaboration. The reporting is consistently fine-grained, evocative, and insightful. It's a fitting testament to the value of local journals. Uh, copies of Greg's book, American Deadline, will be available for purchase tonight with the proceeds. Thank you, Greg. It is benefiting the Ashton Museum. Yeah. So, with no further ado, Greg Glass. <laughs> We, we have some copies of the old Herald Progress, so people that can sort of, actually all of you are pretty familiar with it, looking around the room. Uh, I thought there might be some students that would have no idea what the Herald Progress was in its day. Um, and I miss it terribly. Yeah, we all do, and uh, I don't think that, you know, I don't think that's a debate. Uh, but I thought I'd try to get going by just explaining uh, how I got to the Herald Progress in the first place, a fairly long journey through other newspapers. Uh, and uh, less than two decades, an estimated 2,500 newspapers shut down, most of them weekly newspapers. Among them were the Herald Progress in Ashland and the Caroline Progress in Bowling Green, two newspapers that I had served as editor on and continued to write for as a columnist and occasional reporter until their abrupt demise in March of 2018. As someone who worked for daily and weekly newspapers in some capacity for nearly 50 years, I was well aware that community newspapers had become a dying breed. I worked for two daily and four weekly newspapers in my time. Only one of them remains, and that is a mere shadow of what it was 20 years ago. I realize my experience in newspapers spans the last of the good times and the beginning of the end of many thousands of newspapers, big and small. I also witnessed rapid changes in the technology involved in producing a newspaper, as well as changes in how people get their news, not all of them changes for the good. I majored in journalism and English in college at Penn State, graduating in 1966. At the time, I planned to go on to graduate school and then pursue a career in either advertising, public relations, or newspapers. The Vietnam War draft intervened, and I put those plans on hold for three years. When I got out of the Army, a friend and former classmate got me an interview at the Herald Journal, the afternoon daily in Syracuse, New York, where I worked for the next two years as a reporter and feature writer. I'd actually just gone up to visit this old college friend, and he was moonlighting on the, uh, the night desk of the, uh, of the Herald Journal. And so I invited, uh, invited myself in to see what it was all about. And I talked to some of the people there and got an interview. And they hired me on a probationary basis. Uh, at the time, I was pretty much a hunt and peck typist. Still am, just two fingers. And, uh, I, uh, I, I was given an old manual typewriter to write obits and things like that on a probationary uh, employee on the night desk. And uh, because I was such a slow typist, I was the only one left in the newsroom when uh, word came that there had been a tragic uh, triple fatality fire on the outskirts of Syracuse in the middle of a snowstorm. So the night editor looked around and saw nobody but me and he gave me some directions, which weren't really very good, since I'd never lived in Syracuse in my life before that. And so I went out in the snowstorm of my car looking for this fire. Luckily, I got to an intersection, and while stopped for the red light, uh, I, uh, I noticed a, a red emergency vehicle heading a, across my path. Since I had a red car myself, I just latched onto the bumper of the emergency vehicle, which turned out to be the, the coroner's vehicle, and uh, followed it to the fire. I finally got the story, got back in the newsroom about two or three in the morning. The, uh, the night editor checked it over for me, turned it in, 
And I guess I did a pretty good job because within the next week, I was offered a full-time job at the Syracuse paper. I covered a lot of things, including uh, it's on a three-person team that covered 21 cities and towns and, and villages around Syracuse. Uh, the rapid changes that I witnessed at the uh, Herald Journal uh, were many. We were using those old manual typewriters. We were typing on copy paper that was cut out from the newsprint rolls. And uh, the editors would mark papers up with a grease pencil. And uh, we would, I would go back in the, the, the back shop, kind of volunteered to go back there and watch the composing room. And I would see my prose start out as molten lead in a bucket next to a linotype machine and get transformed into lead type. It would be put together on huge metal tables called turtles, and uh, that was how the newspaper was printed in those days. Uh, nowadays, uh, you could do everything on a computer screen. So it's, it's changed a whole lot. Technology has changed. Newspapers were still making profits back in those days. When we moved into a sparkling new building, old Sam Newhouse, the owner of the newspaper chain, strolled through the newsroom followed by his two sons. The Newhouse boys carried dad's overcoat and his hat and followed him through the, the newsroom on their inspection tour. And that was the only time I'd ever seen the owner of the paper. Uh, later on, however, the two Newhouse boys would make the Forbes list of richest American billionaires. So they were making newspaper money in those days. The afternoon paper in Syracuse went through five daily editions. The last edition was the racetrack edition. It would have all the horses that were running in that evening's races at the tracks. They also had a uh, Thursday edition of the Sunday paper. And this was a paper that they put in vending boxes all along the New York State Thruway from Albany to Buffalo. And tourists would pick up a paper at the rest stops, and I guess uh, dad and would drive, and mom and the kids would read the newspaper while they were driving from one end of New York to the other end. But it was an interesting paper because they didn't really have any up-to-date news that would go in the Sunday paper on Thursday. So they would fill it with whatever Associated Press stories they could find. And for some reason, they always seemed to have stories on the failing health of dictators around the world. I remember that uh, Francisco Franco of Spain and Tito of Yugoslavia were always on death's door and repeated stories uh, worked over this fact. And I looked it up and, and Franco made it another five years and Tito another 10 years. So apparently they had a lot of fodder for the throughway edition uh, for those years. When I look at newspapers today, unfortunately, with their local news staff cut to the bone, they remind me a lot of that throughway edition in Syracuse because a lot of the inside of the daily newspapers today are filled with uh, uh, Associated Press features rather than news generated by their local reporters. From Syracuse, I went on to the Ledger Star in Norfolk, the afternoon daily there. I started out on the science and environmental beat, which allowed me to roam around uh, the, uh, the outer banks of North Carolina eastern shore of Virginia and much of southeastern Virginia. I did stories on the Chincoteague Pony Swim, Pony Swim the rocket launches at Wallops Island. They were doing it way back then. The seafood industry on the eastern shore, beach erosion on the outer banks, and we even covered a large dead whale that washed up on the bridge between Sandbridge, and, washed up on the beach between Sandbridge and Kerala. I still remember standing on the whale's back to give the photographer uh, a chance to demonstrate the size of the, of the whale. And I remember standing there and wondering what would happen if I broke through the skin of the whale. Fortunately, <laughs> it was a pretty tough whale. I think the Smithsonian later uh, took the spine out of the, out of the whale and preserved it. And then the Coast Guard towed the rest of the whale off into the ocean and sank it. I later wor worked as a sports writer and as assistant city editor in the Ledger Star afternoon paper newsroom, we had 70 employees, including reporters and editors, spread out over three locations. And that did not count the photographers and senior editors. The morning Virginian pilot had a similar number of news staffers and reporters, and we engaged in a friendly rivalry 
even though both papers were owned by the same company. The rival staffs were gradually merged into one, and the afternoon paper died like so many afternoon dailies around the country. But the public's tastes were changing, and afternoon daily newspapers were the first to fall. The Leave it to Beaver, Ozzie and Harriet stereotype of the American family was changing in the 50s and 60s. In the old days, Dad would come home from the office, take off his coat and hat, settle down and read the afternoon paper, while stay-at-home mom finished preparations for dinner. Competition from the six o'clock TV news and single-parent households or families with two working parents pretty much killed off the afternoon newspapers. By this time, we had graduated to IBM electric typewriters, and uh, I remember that I was still hitting pretty hard with those two fingers, and they were constantly having to send up repair people to glue the keys back on my IBM typewriter. We would then scan the uh, typewritten pages into a word, word scanner, and then eventually they would go into, uh, into the, the print in the back. The public's tastes were changing, as I said, and afternoon papers were dying. I remember attending a presentation by TV anchorman Roger Mudd, who had started work at newspapers in Richmond and radio in Richmond before he went to television. He said there was a proposal in the early days of TV news to broadcast the news in black and white and the entertainment shows in color so that people could tell the difference between the two. <laughs> the idea didn't take uh, hold apparently, but I can't help wonder how that would work with television today. Would any of what passes for television news today still be in black and white or would it all be in color like the entertainment sections? At the end of 1978, I took a hiatus to complete my MA in history, and when I looked around for another newspaper job, I found myself as editor of the Chesapeake Post, a small weekly newspaper in the growing suburban city south of Norfolk. This was part of a small chain that nibbled around the edges of the larger Norfolk dailies. It depended on legal ads and a couple of dozen or so loyal local businesses for support. I discovered I actually enjoyed being a one-man band who wrote news and feature stories and editorials, took and developed the photos, edited, contributed, and freelance stories, and laid out the pages for offset printing with scissors, an exacto knife, and hot wax. I know Pat Pace remembers the hot wax and the scissors and exacto knives. I met only briefly once a week with the owner whose father had been a professor at the University of North Carolina and wrote a textbook on community newspapers. But I had the place pretty much to myself as editor at the Chesapeake Post. After four years in Chesapeake, my wife and I bought a house on the side of one of the Blue Ridge Mountains and I became editor of another weekly newspaper in Madison, Virginia, a county with more cows than people. And I think it's pretty much the same still. <laughs> I stayed there for nearly 18 years. Our little office on Main Street, which dated back to the 1800s, held me, one reporter, an office manager, and two ad reps. That building has now been sold, and the sole employee on the news staff works out of her home. And that's the one paper that still exists of all the ones that I worked for. Finding news in a small county can be challenging, one week, our lead story was on the fact that actor Sylvester Stallone had stopped his limo at the local Shell station, and the star dashed in, purchased a bag of potato chips, a six-pack of beer, and signed the cash register account a receipt for the uh, starstruck clerk, who I interviewed after the fact. I wasn't actually there when Sylvester stopped. Other stories were bigger stories. We had a once-in-500-year flood when uh, a weather pattern dumped 30 inches of rain uh, in 36 hours on parts of Madison County and parts of the mountains actually washed down. Uh, I recall that the bridges were washed out so I couldn't get home and I spent a couple of nights uh, sleeping on the floor of our newspaper office uh, with a bale of newspapers for a pillow. But we got the story out and the paper came out on time. When I arrived at the Madison Eagle, it had been owned by Worrell Enterprises, which started out as a small family-owned chain and grew into a larger chain, 
that owned daily newspapers in Bristol, Lynchburg, and Charlottesville, as well as a number of weeklies. Uh, these newspapers were beginning to feel the pinch, but they were still profitable for the owners. Uh, they would rotate their publishers almost yearly back then, and the goal of each publisher when he walked in a newspaper was to find money to cut. And the money was sometimes personnel that would be cut out of jobs. And that was the trend of the, the bigger chains that, that started buying newspapers and operating them pretty much as a profitable enterprise, which all newspapers should be, but trying to really eliminate some of the good things about newspapers. I became acutely aware that the owners of the paper were making much more money than the people that worked there when a friend gave me a yachting magazine with the feature story on an 80-foot motor yacht being built in Amsterdam for Tommy Worrell, the son of the founder of Worrell Enterprises. I realize this makes me sound like a disgruntled auto worker complaining about the multi-million dollar pay packages of his company's CEO, but I do so to illustrate that newspaper chains were quite profitable until fairly recently. In 1995, the Worrell newspapers, including the one I worked at in Madison, were bought by Media General, a larger chain which included the Richmond Times-Dispatch. By the late 1990s, all newspapers were feeling increased pressure from television, cable TV, and the new kid on the block, the internet. To put this in perspective, Amazon sold its very first book in 1995. Facebook started on the campus of Harvard University a mere 19 years ago. And Twitter had its first tweet 17 years ago. The growth of internet news and social media has been amazingly quick. For a number of years, newspaper owners seemed baffled by the World Wide Web and how to deal with it. They had competed with television news by buying TV stations themselves. But the internet was a different animal. I can remember a Media General annual report about 20 years ago in which the company bragged that it lost only $2 million on its websites compared to three or four million the previous year. So they were grappling with the idea of how to make money uh, and uh, I don't think that anybody has really figured it out yet. In 2004, I made the leap from Madison County to Ashland where the Herald Progress had enjoyed decades of stability under the Watkins family, which bought the weekly paper in the 1930s. They were followed by Jay Pace and his family, which bought the paper in 1981. A small group of investors who owned the Central Virginia newspaper in Louisa purchased the HP from the Paces after Jay passed away suddenly. They needed someone who could serve as editor. They knew me from my years in Madison, and they knew I could get out a reasonably sound weekly newspaper with very limited resources. I had just one reporter and a couple of freelancers in Madison, so the Ashland newspaper looked like a step up. At the Herald Progress, I would have three reporters, a staff photographer, and a newsroom assistant. After I was hired, I was told that the photographer's job had already been cut, the first of many cuts to come. Fortunately, I was lucky to find some uh, talented freelancers, uh, the two photographers that I depended on heavily, Skip Rowland and the late Nick Liberante, uh, supplied us with excellent photos uh, for a very low cost. After my, after my wife and I moved to Ashland in 2004, I discovered I was welcomed by some HP readers and regarded by others as an unwelcome interloper. The transition from a family-owned newspaper to corporate ownership, even a small corporation, was not easy. Over time, the subscribers got used to me and I to them. Unlike before, when the editor was also the owner and publisher, I was a hired hand with little or no say over the financial decisions. I found I liked being able to watch the newspaper roll off the printing press, a luxury that I had never had before. A couple of years later, the press was sold to a broker who shipped it off to a buyer in Mexico, and the entire production staff was laid off. The new owners decided it was a luxury they could no longer afford. The grand new building that Jay Pace built in the Hanover Air Park was put up for sale, and we moved into smaller offices. It's now, incidentally, if you don't remember, it's now the 
uh, Center of the Universe Brewery. In 2007, the Louisans threw up their hands and sold out to Lakeway Publishing, a small chain of mostly weekly newspapers in Tennessee. More cuts would be on the way. When I retired as editor of the HP on November 3rd, 2012, the news staff was down to one editor, one full-time reporter, and a newsroom assistant receptionist. Pretty much what I had in Little Madison County 10 years before, but with a much larger county to cover. <clears throat> I could kick and scream as much uh, as I could. Each position was cut, and I could voice my disapproval when we started charging for obituaries, wedding announcements, and other services that readers expected of us. But most of this fell on deaf ears. When local newspapers become part of a larger chain, they cease to be responsive to the needs of their community to some degree, and the people making the, finan the financial decisions may not even live in the same county or state of the newspaper. Yet that became the trend in the new millennium. I recall telling my publisher that we were becoming less and less relevant to the readers that we served with each budget cut and each staff cut and our paid circulation reflected this, unfortunately. During my last year as editor of the Herald Progress, the newspaper industry experienced a brief glimmer of hope when most of the media general papers, including the Times-Dispatch and the Freelance Star, uh, and uh, the Little Weekly I once worked for in Madison, were purchased by financial guru Warren Buffett. If the Oracle of Omaha thought newspapers were still viable, it must be so, everybody thought. Another eight years later, Buffett unloaded the former media general papers for less than he paid for them to lead newspapers of Davenport, Iowa. Buffett was quoted as, a say, quoted as saying, newspapers are toast. As a footnote, however, Buffett sold the newspapers but not the buildings they occupied. He's been selling the properties off ever since, including the little circa 1800 building I worked on for 18 years in Madison. After retiring from the Herald Progress, I continued on as a freelance columnist and covered occasional stories. I was also called in to get out a few papers for a few weeks while a succession of editors was hired and additional cuts made. I had been at the HP for eight years. The newspaper would go through five more editors in the final six years. In 2015, for some reason that I can't quite fathom, I came out of retirement for about six months and served as editor of the Caroline Progress, another longtime family-run paper that had been acquired by Lakeway Publishing. There I had but one energetic and overtaxed part-time reporter who was working for, and I was working for two-thirds of my previous salary. After about six months of that, I decided that I preferred retirement to being back in the newspaper game. It was no longer fun. By 2017, the Caroline Progress office in Bowling Green had been closed, and both the CP and HP were being put out in one office uh, on, uh, on Thompson Street in, in Ashland, the old Herald Progress building. The corporate owners had run out of positions to cut, in late May 2018, a corporate official strode into the office and informed the remaining staff that the issue they were working on that week would be the last for both papers. The Herald Progress left behind a 131-year legacy of community journalism, journalism and uh, the uh, Caroline Progress shut down after 99 years of service. It happened so fast, there was no time for the staff to even get out a farewell edition. Both of these papers left a void in their communities. The Mechanicsville Local was already serving the eastern portion of Hanover County and had morphed into the Mechanicsville Ashland Local, picking up some of the slack there. But it too now is feeling the financial pinch five years later and it's seen its staff, its page count, and its news content shrink considerably. In Caroline County, where I now live, the void left by the Caroline Progress is even more apparent than it is here in Hanover County. Several attempts were made to fill the gap in Caroline County and all failed. Soon after the Caroline Progress shut down, residents of Caroline County began receiving in their mailboxes 
the Caroline Star Weekly. This rather thin, free publication was put out by the Fredericksburg paper and consisted of local and regional advertising wrapped in a variety of news stories culled from the previous seven issues of the Daily Freelance Star. After about six months, the plug was pulled on this publication because they couldn't make a go of it. Another attempt to fill the void was launched by Caroline residents, Tony Aris and his wife, Kim. Aris was a part-time preacher who was active in the Democratic Committee in Caroline and saw a need for a local newspaper. So he took photos, wrote stories, sold ads, and started distributing something called the Virginia Connection in December 2018. Subscriptions were offered, but there were a few takers. The connection appeared in local restaurants and on business countertops, but never really caught on. It consisted mainly of government press releases and was, uh, and was a news story occasionally, and what was opinion uh, news was not clearly delineated, which caused a lot of consternation among the readers. After realizing that he had invested his time and a big chunk of his life savings in the project, he gave up. Subscriptions were so low it breaks my soul, he, he commented to me. To date, no new publications have appeared in Caroline County. Residents get a few local stories from the Fredericksburg Daily, which is operating with a dwindling and dispirited staff and serves about six other counties and jurisdictions, Caroline being among the smallest. They also depend on a few Facebook sites that offer advice on how to hire a good plumber or carpenter. They regurgitate county press releases and they run secondhand news items as well as rumors and speculation. Once again, there's nobody really showing people what's what. And that's something that's missing in a lot of these online uh, systems. So what are we missing when our sometimes maligned, sometimes beloved weekly newspapers shut down? I realized that I was a throwback to the old days of community journalism. I'd always believed that anyone, regardless of their status and life achievements, was entitled to get his or her name in the local newspaper for free on at least four occasions. When they were born, when they graduated from high school or college, when they were married, and when they died. I resisted change, uh, charging for these services to no avail. You now pay for your birth announcement, your wedding announcement, your obituary, and I guess they still list the graduates uh, uh, in name only, nothing, nothing about them, but in name only. I believe a good community newspaper should also run upcoming events, meeting notices of civic groups and political committees. They should cover high school events and high school and college sports. Uh, Randolph-Macon College has had a terrific football team last year and this year, and the basketball team has been excellent, and that's something that the, the Herald Progress was always on top of before I got there and after I, I started working there, we would always have a reporter at the home games and provide a lot of coverage of Randolph-Macon sports. But I see that missing right now. Most importantly, local newspapers should attend and report on town council meetings, county board of supervisor meetings, planning commission meetings, and school board meetings. If you've attended these types of meetings, you know they can be pretty dull but it actually helps to have a trained reporter who's at those meetings, sits through the whole thing, asks questions afterwards, and then writes a story up that focuses on the things that were important that happened during those three or four hour sessions. And newspapers also need someone with some education and experience in journalism, making decisions on what is or not newsworthy in your community. These are functions that were once performed by almost all of the 2,500 or more community newspapers we have lost over the past 20 years. And I'll add to that, that that's an old figure. I think there's been another three or 400 that we've lost in the last two or three years. So it's, it's going on and it's continuing to go on. I tried to include in my newspapers a local editorial, my editor's column, letters to the editor, an editorial cartoon and guest editorials or op-ed pieces written by local people. 
My mission in my own eyes was to put out a newspaper that informed, educated, and entertained the reader. A good editor was the gatekeeper, calling on his or her educational, vocational training, and good judgment to determine what was fit to print. Without a local newspaper, you are well aware of who is running for office in two or three key legislative or congressional districts in the state of Virginia, because you can't avoid it watching television. The ads are all on these target districts. But you may be unaware of who's actually running for office in your own county. I had to actually go to the registrar's office in Caroline because I realized I was going to vote early and I had no idea who was on the ballot because nobody had informed me of that. So I picked up a sample ballot, but that doesn't do much if you don't know who the people's names are. The names are there, but you don't know who's behind the name. So you have to kind of do your own research simply to be an educated voter. Weekly newspapers that I published sample ballots and candidate profiles or questionnaires before every election. Without newspapers, you may never see local letters to the editor or local op-ed pieces expressing views with which you may not always agree, but at least you are exposed to them. Unless you are vigilant, you may not even know when the town council or board of supervisors is voting on a major development that will affect your life and property. All of this seems to be missing when we rely on social media as our news source. Let me get on to the, the book and the process that went into that. Uh, and I will reiterate that uh, the museum is selling copies and uh, the proceeds go to the museum. In the autumn of 2019, I was urged to call Michael Shapiro, a professor at Columbia University, who wanted to know if I was interested in writing 10 monthly dispatches on what life was like in Caroline County, a community that had recently lost its only weekly newspaper. Over the course of several phone calls and email exchanges, the professor explained that he was editor of the Delacort Review, an online journal, and he was, uh, realized that he and his colleagues at Columbia knew that they really didn't know what people were thinking out there in rural and small town America and how they were coping with the loss of local newspapers. They zeroed in on Caroline County for two reasons. One, that it had recently experienced the death of its weekly newspaper after 99 years of service. And two, because it was one of just a handful of pivot counties in Virginia that had voted pretty much a straight democratic ticket in the past presidential elections, and then turned around and voted for Donald Trump in 2016. The Columbia professor explained that he was looking for someone on the ground in Caroline County, or have resided since 2008, who could write a folksy monthly dispatch uh, in the tone of a letter home. As I set about thinking about how I could best describe Caroline County and its residents to the week and the weekly newspaper they had lost, Shapiro signed up three other correspondents, Jason Togiar from McKeesport, Pennsylvania, a Rust Belt town, Charles Richardson from Macon, Georgia, and Sandra Sanchez from McAllen, Texas, a border town on the Rio Grande River. Each of us was assigned a Columbia J School professor as editors that we would work with closely over the next year. Soon after we started, the Columbia Journalism Review got word of the proposed of the project and agreed to run the series. The result of that 2020 series is now incorporated in the book, American Deadline, reporting from four new star towns in the Trump era. Although the original aim was to capture what life was like during a presidential election year in a community without a healthy newspaper, a whole lot more happened in 2020. Think about it for a moment. We needed to weave this into our narrative. This included the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on social life and on the economy. We needed to uh, take in, into task the death of George Floyd in the Black Lives Matter movement, also the controversy over Confederate statues in Virginia, and the ongoing issue of illegal immigration. 
In one of the ironies of this project, I submitted several scenic photos to illustrate Caroline County for their purposes. And the one they selected was of the ubiquitous Confederate soldier statue standing guard over the Caroline County Courthouse in Bowling Green. By year's end, that statue had been dismantled and relocated after a contentious series of public hearings. Another irony was that the man at the Virginia Press Association who recommended me to the folks at Columbia was the same man who as an executive of Lakeway Publishing had strode into the Herald Progress office in 2018 and told the staff that they no longer had jobs. As the first con uh, correspondent hired, I was charged with writing the first dispatch. I realized I needed to concoct a word picture of Caroline County and the surrounding area for a nationwide audience, as well as for the folks in New York City and my fellow correspondents in Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Texas. Under the additional challenge of social distancing, I interviewed many Caroline County residents, public officials, and civic leaders for the 2020 series that were incorporated in the new book. I remember coming to this very campus, Randolph-Macon College, to interview, interview Professor Alphine Jefferson, who's in our audience, in his office. And I believe we were the only two people in the building that day. The office was pretty much cleared of students and faculty because of the pandemic. Anyway, I promised myself and my fellow Ashland Museum board members that this talk would be more about community newspapers and what has befallen them than a mere recitation of what you might read by uh, getting this book. So I'd like to open up for questions, comments, and any ideas you might care to share with all of us in the room on how we might be able to replace some of the essential services that community newspapers once provided. Anybody got any ideas? Yes, Pat. Um, I would just like to make a bit of a clarification. The Herald Progress was never very rich. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't mean to, uh, you were not a chain either. We, uh, no, no, you were not a big newspaper. We spent on having three reporters and a photographer, which was very unusual. Yeah, yeah, no, I know that Jay plowed the money back into the paper. <laughs> yeah, I, I realize that. I didn't, I meant the, the larger uh, chains that we have right. were the ones that were making the money. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I remember having to, uh, and this was uh, under the new ownership, but just having to plead and argue for an extra two pages that I could put the stories in because we had that many stories and we weren't allowed enough room for it. Uh, I don't know how, what, what ratio the, the Herald Progress had, but one of the rules of thumb of, of a former publisher told me was that you had to have 35% paid advertising in the newspaper pages. And then for the post office, you had to have under 70% advertising because the post office would not let you mail the periodical rate if you had over 70% of advertising. So you had that little spot in the middle where you could, you could make a little more profit or, and add more stories if you were able to. Any ideas on what we can do about the situation? Is yeah. anywhere in the country where colleges or universities have taken up that deficit of news and had their own paper, you know, be yeah. just a college. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry we don't have any students in the audience because I'm really hopeful that we can kind of throw an idea at them. And maybe we can still do that through some of our professors at Randolph-Macon, that uh, they could actually make it a, a classroom project to put out a, a weekly newspaper for Ashland and uh, learn how it's put together and how you do it. And uh, it wouldn't necessarily have to be printed. I think one of the keys to any, any newspapers in the future, I know we all like paging through this newsprint. We all like having it in our hands. Uh, we've done it all our lives. I remember I learned how to read by watching the Sunday comics read over the TV screen Sunday morning. And I'd be able to learn how to read by watching them read the comics on TV. And then later when we get the paper, I could start reading the comics. Um, yeah, it's the, the print newspaper is probably 
got its days numbered because of the cost of production, uh, cost of maintaining vendor boxes and vendor sites, uh, distribution through the post office cost money. Um, every time I look at the, uh, the Richmond Times Dispatch and Freelance Star in Fredericksburg and see that $3 single copy price, I practically faint because who can afford to buy daily newspapers for $3 a pop? Yeah. It, uh, it's just not feasible, but I think that it is feasible to have a digital version. I subscribe to the Freelance Star in Fredericksburg online, and I get the same format that's in the print newspaper, and I can page from page to page, and it's something I do, usually I do the Wordle and the Waffle puzzles first, and then I, <laughs> and I read the Freelance Star in the morning on the digital, digital edition. So that's something that is viable, I know people have also talked about uh, having the government step in in some form and put out a newspaper in a community. Um, I don't know if that's actually been tried anywhere. It's, it sounds to me like something that really wouldn't work because I don't know that people are going to really trust the county supervisors putting out a newspaper about the county. It's just something that's not in our nature to, to swallow, I think. Uh, one thing that, that I have come across that is viable, and that's an online news service subsidized by grants or donations. An example of this is the Virginia Mercury. I don't know if any of you have ever gone to the Virginia Mercury. Uh, interestingly enough, Sarah Vogelsong, who was my reporter at the Caroline Progress in 2015, is now the editor of the Virginia Mercury. And this was originally started by environmental groups because they wanted to have accurate stories about threats to the environment in the state of Virginia. But it's morphed into something more than that. They have a number of former Richmond Times Dispatch reporters that lost their jobs and now write for the Virginia Mercury. So this is the kind of thing that can survive and provide you with professionally done, professionally edited, and uh, stories that, that somebody has vetted for fact rather than fiction. Greg, and when you started talking about that, it, it made me think in terms of almost like a, a PBS newspaper. Yeah, that's sort of. Locally done yeah. and supported by people. Now, I am one of those that still want my, my print copy. Yeah. I mean, I love doing it. The, yeah. the paper itself is it, it's so limited now in yeah. what it offers. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, Tragedy. But from what I understand, if you're saying I don't do the, the computer thing because I don't like reading off of the computer, but it has the same layout, the same material yeah. and everything, mm -hmm. well, it seems to me they should be able to expand what's on the computer as compared to what's in the, the print copy. Well, I think part of the problem is that they don't have the people to do it. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, the Freelance Star Newsroom. Uh, a reporter there told me they were down to seven human beings in the newsroom to cover the news for Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania, Stafford, Caroline, uh, a bunch of other counties that they try to cover with uh, seven reporters, basically. So, well, for example, it, for the Richmond newspaper, when I read that tragic story that Holmberg, do you all remember him? Mark, Mark Holmberg, that he wrote uh, about um, fentanyl and Mm -hmm. about, about drugs and whatnot. I, 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 the beauty of his writing, I had forgotten how much I missed that from the Richmond newspaper mm -hmm. because he used to have the most wonderful, yeah. interesting articles yeah. so beautifully written. And, and because of the cutbacks in staff, um, you're getting, uh, I don't want to denigrate anyone, but you're going to have an inevitable, inevitable cutback in the experience and the quality of the members of that staff, simply because they're not going to be able to afford to work there anymore. And that's something that we ran into with the weeklies. I would, I would try to hire, I knew that my reporters would usually be fresh out of college looking for their first job, and they would move on uh, after a year or two because they'd need to make a living uh, doing what they want to do. And you couldn't afford to pay the entry level reporters anything that one individual could actually live on. So it's, it's a tough way to do it. Um, but anyway, I, I, I don't know if we've opened up any kind of 
brainstorms in anybody's head. Uh, I know that people have approached me and said, oh, well, why don't you start one? And I say, well, first of all, I'm almost 79 years old. I'm not going to be able to do it. And second of all, it take, it would, as a hobby, I don't think it's feasible. You're going to probably have to have at least one professional paid individual and then some freelancers and, and then a lot of people that are capable of writing in the community that could put something in. And when the editor went through it and edited it, it would be decent to run in the newspaper. So there are some possibilities along those lines. I hope I didn't open up any uh, uh, false expectations because I don't have the answer to, uh, to what we can do to get legitimate, uh, well written and well thought out and, uh, and well researched news in our local communities once the newspaper dies. Well, I don't want it to die because I get the paper mainly because I read the obituaries. I can read them online, but I read the obituaries, and if I know that person, I cut the obituary out and save it because I can always go back when somebody says, Oh, when did so and so die? Well, let me get my information and all that. I can remember as a four or five year old visiting my grandmother in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and uh, she'd send me down, she lived in a second floor apartment, she'd send me down to get the newspaper off the porch, and I'd bring it up, and she'd immediately turn to the obit page, and I'd say, I found that sort of macabre, so I said, grandmother, why do you always choose to turn to the obit page first? And she would say, because that's where my friends are. Yes, and it's sad but true. And that's also one way, and that's something that we're, we're really missing. Um, the Freelance Star, I, I, re, I look through their obits, but they're Fredericksburg obits. I don't see many people from Caroline County, and I certainly don't see any people from Ashland County in the Fredericksburg obits. So it's, it's a, a, another thing that funeral homes have done some of this on their own. You can go to them, but you have to do all this yourself. You have to pick and choose Facebook pages and websites uh, and then judge them yourself as to whether they're going to be useful to you and then keep going to them just to get news every day. So it's, it's a tough situation. Greg, Alphine. To what extent do you think CNN and the 24-hour news cycle we have on television all the time now has affected and diminished the value? Well, yeah, it, it, certainly cable news and, and as well as the, the uh, regional six o'clock news really affected things. And I know you get into an argument with almost anybody, maybe not this audience, but a lot of audiences, an argument about uh, fair and balanced newspapers, fair and balanced television, and what is and isn't real, and what's fake news. And that's something that, that's become a big, big talking point for politicians. Um, I always looked at it that the owners of the newspapers, and maybe the Pace family accepted, the owners of the newspaper were rather wealthy and took a conservative view of things. And the, uh, the, the reporters running around gathering the news for the newspaper were probably starving and weren't making much money, and they took a liberal view of things. I realize that's simplistic, but there was sort of a checks and balances between the owners of the newspaper who might look at things one way and the reporters that might look at things another way. Jay was fairly liberal for Hanover County, yeah. and the word went around, whoever he endorsed, the other person was going to win. <laughs> I remember I, I ran one letter to the editor here in Ashland, and he accused me of being a communist. So oh. that was pretty strong words. I, I think I gave a flippant reply to that. I said that uh, after being uh, a mole for 30 years, he'd finally found me out. <laughs> I had another, one of my pieces of mail that I still have was addressed to me when I was at the, the Norfolk paper, and the envelope simply said, Greg the Dope Glasner. And so <laughs> I went on. Well, Greg, do you still go down and drive old cars like you used to do and write articles about them? Uh, I do. I still do a newsletter for a car club, and uh, I, I, I still... Uh, get around a few car shows and car events every year. Yeah. Do you think that we as a society have 
moved away from wanting to be informed and now we just want to be entertained. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I don't think, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of Fox News, but I've turned that channel on and I can see, I mean, their graphics are better than other, I mean, every, everything about it, they, they hire beautiful women. <laughs> <laughs> That'll get your attention. <laughs> But I think it's, I think. Might, might I not get the attention of your wives, but they get your attention. I think people, <laughs> by and large, don't care so much about being informed now as they want to be entertained. Yeah, yeah. And that, I mean, even the weather girls that uh, are hired to, uh, to look pretty rather than give you accurate weather reports and that sort of thing, um, that that's kind of goes back to what Roger Mudd was talking about, the idea that uh, uh, you needed to delineate between the news and the entertainment on television. And I think those lines have been pretty well blurred so that uh, some of the entertainment is actually news and some of the, the news is actually 90% entertainment. Okay, well I'm gonna turn it over to Betsy and let her I'll tell you why it stopped. The publisher <laughs> cut out paying to have it bound. Well, they were doing, um, <laughs> they were, all, they were uh, doing them on the computer, and so they had digital versions yeah. of them, and, and they didn't bound the paper, and then they started picking back up. So we have a couple of, two, like 2012, 2013. Um, sooner or later, those will all be online, too. But if you're interested in looking through either the hard copies that we have at the museum, please let us know. You can come in and take a look. Or I have no complaints about the Virginia Chronicle because I've done a lot of research, but that it's, um, it's easy to sit at your computer and to and flip through those pages yeah. and of those old issues. Um, we do have copies of Graves' book for sale, thirty dollars cash check with charge. I don't have anything else to add. Thank you, Greg. Thank, Thank you, Greg. I rarely step out from behind the camera, but I do want to say that having known Jay and knowing Greg and Angie Miller and Dan Sherrier, I mean, I just can't tell you how much I appreciate what you have all done for the town of Ashland and for the Herald Progress, and I really, really miss it. Dan has his own uh, blog and uh, online presence. Uh, he's now uh, writing and publishing Superhero books. Yes. <laughs> Science fiction superhero books. Yes, I've read one. It's good. good. I, I was just going to add the, the podcast world of sharing the stories and bringing people together. I was thinking about the history of, um, I just went to Vietnam and I can remember my dad talking about when he was a little boy, he'd go to the movies and he'd get all the news there, like in the very beginning clips of the movie theater. Mm -hmm. But I, I just feel like you sharing, and I miss that paper so much. I miss those stories mm -hmm. um, so much. Um, I echo what Tom was saying. Um, I think bringing people together and getting
getting the real truth, the fact checks, and talking to each other and sharing information is just critical. Um, and I think the museum serves a purpose of, of um, keeping our history going, right? And sharing stories, so, and our history, and, and that's the news, too. So, anyway, I hope mm. we can keep that going. Yeah, I was looking through one of the Facebook sites that serves Ashland, and I don't know what it's called, but I, I get it. Uh, it comes up in my Facebook. And uh, one resident showed a picture of a snake that was in her backyard. And uh, she was seriously trying to find out if this was a harmless snake or a poisonous snake. And she got something like 17 answers. And the first answer was, it's a cobra. Well, obviously, it wasn't a cobra. <laughs> And several other answers were equally inane. And you had to go way down to find out somebody that directed her to the uh, Virginia Department of Natural Resources website where she could identify the snake. And she even came back on and said, my kid is getting off the school bus in 15 minutes. I just want to know if he can play in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> so Facebook has its limitations, certainly. Hmm? Was it a poisonous snake? No, it was harmless. <laughs> yeah, I think I don't like black snake or something like that. Or a king snake. You know? It was different color as a baby than it was as a, an adult snake. And so it, it did look a little fearsome. But it's either a black snake or a king snake, both of mm -hmm. which are the Thank you, Thank you.